Thanks, Bill. Thanks to all of you for coming out tonight. I'm sure there were things on television you might have chosen to watch tonight instead of John and I in the panel. I have an impossible job in some ways. Uh, my normal college lecture is two hours long, and I've got an hour tonight, so I could either talk twice as fast or leave out some of the funny lines and the slides, and I've chosen the latter. Uh, let me start with my conclusions after 38 years of study and investigation. Four major conclusions, and I'll take you by the hand after that, past the evidence that has led me to those conclusions. First, that the evidence is overwhelming, that planet Earth is being visited by intelligently controlled extraterrestrial spacecraft. In other words, some, underline the some 18 times, some UFOs are alien spacecraft. Most UFOs are not. I don't care about those. The second conclusion is that we're dealing with a cosmic water gate. That means some few people within governments, the United States, Britain, Canada, and probably Australia, have known since July 1947, when two crash flying saucers are recovered with several bodies in New Mexico, that indeed some UFOs are extraterrestrial spacecraft. Third, none of the arguments made against the first two conclusions by the debunkers of the world stand up under careful scrutiny. Their arguments sound wonderful until you look at the evidence, which of course they don't do, then they collapse of their own weight. And finally, four, we're dealing with the biggest story of the millennium. Visits to planet Earth by alien spacecraft, successful cover-up of the best data, the bodies and the wreckage for almost 50 years. Strong words, but I think you'll see how I got there. I do need to put in a definition up front here. Uh, that's to prove I'm a physicist, you know, otherwise you wouldn't know that. Uh, three different kinds, categories of UFO sightings. And it's important to distinguish amongst them. First, we have the UFOs that are converted to IFOs, identifiable flying objects. That's the majority of the sightings. Having said that, throw them out. They're the noise. We want the signal. Category two also must be thrown out because it's those cases for which there is insufficient information on which to base a rational judgment. So scratch that category. That leaves us only with the sightings in category three as a database for a serious effort to come to grips with what are we dealing with with regard to flying saucers. These are the reports by competent observers of strange phenomena in the sky or on the ground which the observer cannot identify, which remain unidentified after investigation by competent investigators, and which we judge to be manufactured objects based on the way they look, and to have been manufactured elsewhere than on Earth based on the way they behave. A lot of kickers on that last definition. And the skeptic, are there any skeptics here? Two, three, four, five, wow. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't worry about what the skeptics think. You guys can reach your own conclusion later. <laughs> the skeptic would say with that last definition that I just killed the rest of the lecture because we all know since we hear it so often from the debunkers that there aren't any good sightings that can't be identified by competent investigators and certainly no indication we're dealing with extraterrestrial spacecraft. Right? Wrong. Totally false. Definitely untrue. Completely incorrect. You get the point. A major point I'd like to make tonight is that every large-scale scientific study of flying saucers, and I'll talk about five of them, has produced a substantial number of Category 2 reports. Competent observer, competent investigator, every indication we're dealing with somebody else's spacecraft. The problem isn't that there isn't enough data to substantiate my conclusions. The problem is that most people aren't aware of that data. So believe it or not, I want to devote the first portion of my lecture to the evidence. As an old-fashioned scientist, I think that's where one should start. The largest official comprehensive scientific study of flying saucers ever done was completed, believe it or not, way back in 1955, before many of you were born. The study was done by Battelle Memorial Institute in Columbus, Ohio, under contract to what was then thought to be the only Air Force group concerned with UFOs, namely the old Project Blue Book, located at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base just outside Dayton, Ohio, not far away. And it was Patel's job to go through the more than 3,000 sightings in the Blue Book files for the period 1948 through 1953. 
Every sighting was categorized as something or other, aircraft, balloon, astronomical, etc. A quality evaluation was done on every case, and they put together a big fat report, Project Blue Book, special report number 14, which unfortunately was never publicly distributed by the Air Force. Instead, very wide distribution was given to a three-part package. A press release, from which I'll quote in a minute, a supposed summary, which somehow doesn't include any of the data from the 247 charts, tables, graphs, and maps. I don't know how you can call it a summary if you don't include the data, but they did, and they got away with it. And an official Air Force drawing of sort of a comic book flying saucer. And the thrust of this package was, we just finished this huge study, there's nothing to flying saucers, but soon we'll be building things that look like this drawing, and if you see one, don't worry about it, it's ours. Let's turn the lights down, the projector on. <laughs> There's a cover of the pri privately published version of Blue Book Special Report 14, and that's the drawing I was talking about. And believe it or not, that thing did get built. It was a Canadian-American Avro car. That's the important ones. Those are the ones you want off. Because they, that's it. That's it. That's fine. That's good, because that takes the light off the screen, right? You can see that slide? Okay. Now, what the public was told in the press release by the Secretary of the Air Force, and I'm going to move this because I want to be able to look at the screen and not turn my head in two directions. What the public was told by the Air Force Secretary was, quote, on the basis of this report, we believe that no objects such as those popularly described as flying saucers have overflown the United States. Even the unknown 3% could have been identified as conventional phenomena or illusions if more complete observational data had been available." Unquote. That seems to include two factual statements. Percentage of unknowns was only 3%. The only reason those, those sightings couldn't be explained is that there wasn't enough data. By my definition, there are only Category 2 reports, there are no Category 3 reports, and we can forget all this nonsense about flying saucers. There's only one little problem with the two factual statements. They are both totally and completely false. This is the categorization. That's better. Of the 3,201 sightings. A psychological means psychological aberration, crackpot cases. One and a half percent. Any psychiatrist tell you at least two percent of the people are crazy, so one and a half percent is not a very high number. All right, the sightings we're interested in are the unknowns. That's my category three. You notice it was 21 and a half percent. Not three percent. Obviously, the Secretary of the Air Force wasn't too sharp at arithmetic. Equally obvious, he wasn't very observant, or he would have noticed, as all of you have by now, the next to the last category up here called insufficient information. They stress, if vital information was missing about a sighting, it absolutely could not be listed as an unknown. Instead, and appropriately, it had to be listed as insufficient information. Exactly the opposite of what we were told by the Secretary of the Air Force. Now those skeptics in the hall will say, hey, wait a minute, you slipped in there before that they did a quality evaluation of all those sightings. How do we know that those unknowns aren't just the two-second observations at three in the morning by the town drunks of the world? Perfectly legitimate question, you don't know, so let's look at the data. This is the quality evaluation of the same 3,200 sightings. These are all percentages here. Well, I'll learn how to do this, I guess. Uh, of the excellent cases, 35% were unknowns. Of the good ones, only, that's an Air Force word, only 26% were unknowns, and fewer than 20% for the doubtful and poor. Amazingly enough, the better the quality of the sighting, the more likely to be an unknown. Exactly what you'd expect if the unknowns were really something different and exactly the opposite of what the skeptics always tell you. Now, that raises the $64 billion question. 
if the unknowns weren't aircraft, and they weren't balloons, and they weren't astronomical, and they weren't miscellaneous, and they weren't the ones for which there wasn't enough data, just what out of this world were they? And you say, wait a minute, how'd you get out of this world from just a bunch of numbers? Well, I didn't, as far as I know. I've never been out of this world. It's a combination of two things taken together. The physical appearance of the unknowns. Forget about the knowns and the not enough data cases, just the unknown. The physical appearance of those coupled with the behavior of those unknowns. What they look like? Well, typically we're dealing with apparently round, symmetrically, symmetric, seemingly metallic, disc-shaped objects. Definite size, shape, surface texture, uh, protuberances that might be landing gear, might be antenna, might be decorations. We don't know. Those are interpretations. Uh, size ranging from maybe 10 feet in diameter up to 150 feet in diameter. A much smaller number of huge cigar-shaped so-called motherships into and out of which the little disks fly. By huge, I mean, as one pilot said, five times the size of a 747. Another one said twice the size of an aircraft carrier. That's huge by reasonable standard. Now, with just a physical description, there's no reason to say these things are from off the earth. Because a whole bunch of companies down here that could build things that look as I described, you know, Boeing and McDonnell Douglas and Lockheed and Airbus and so forth. It's only when you add into the picture the behavior of these objects that you say, hey, they weren't made here. Especially back then. Because these round, metallic, disc-shaped objects were able to hover sit still in the sky, move straight up, straight down, move forward and then back without circling around, move at extremely high speeds horizontally, say uh, 7,000 miles an hour is observed on radar, make almost right angle turns at relatively high speeds, like 2,000 miles an hour. All of this rather unusual flying behavior, typically without much noise, without any visible external engines, without any wings, without any tail, without any exhaust, without any blinking red and green lights, often with the glow on, not around the observer but around the object. <laughs> and I submit to you that prior to 1955, there was no company on the surface of our planet that could build things that both looked as I described and acted as I described. Because if there were, we earthlings, that's a presumption but a working hypothesis, <laughs> we earthlings would no longer be building F-16s, 17s, 18s, MiG-29s, Mirage 5s, because from a government viewpoint, what matters about flying saucers is the technology, not the philosophical implications. They can literally fly circles around anything we got flying. If we could build things that flew like that back then, we wouldn't be building F-16, 17s, etc. We are still building those vehicles, so therefore what was observed back then wasn't built here on Earth. It was built someplace else. Now, it doesn't answer any of your question, you know, where are they from, what do they want, how do they operate, why don't they land on the White House lawn or in the middle of Sydney, next to the Opera House, you know, unusual shapes and all that stuff. Uh, doesn't answer those questions, it just says not manufactured here, therefore manufactured someplace else. Where do I think they're from? From other solar systems in our local galactic neighborhood. Please don't tell me about other galaxies. I don't care about other galaxies. Our own galaxy is quite large enough. About 200 billion stars, about 80,000 light years across, spiral pancake, if you will. Later I'll name a specific place, but certainly I'm talking about solar systems within our local galactic neighborhood. Meaning within 54 light years of here, there are 1,000 stars of which 46 are similar to the sun and might be expected to have planets in life. And we'll name, as I say, a specific place later. But forget all this nonsense about how can you get here from another galaxy? I don't know, and I don't care. All right. Now, the guys who did this study, careful, competent, conservative professionals spending full time, this wasn't a bunch of amateurs, they asked an obvious question, one that may have occurred to you already. Did we miss the boat when, he, when we did this screening process? Is there really any difference between the unknowns and the knowns? They did a chi-square statistical analysis. Don't worry if you don't know what that means. They looked at six different characteristics, apparent color, size, shape, speed, that sort of thing. Unknowns versus knowns. The results are easy to describe. They found that the probability that the unknowns were just misknowns was less than 1%. Less than 1%. Now, that doesn't prove they're different. 
It says it's very unlikely that the unknowns are just misknowns because the two groups don't match in any of the six characteristics that were checked. And maneuverability, certainly an outstanding feature, wasn't even considered. This is exactly the opposite of what the skeptics will try to tell you. They'll tell you there's no difference between the unknowns and the knowns. The fact is, there's no similarity. Uh, let's get rid of another myth, incidentally. Duration of observation. The myth being, oh, UFO sightings only last a few seconds. They're like automobile accidents. You can't trust eyewitness testimony. Sounds great. It's nonsense. 60% of the unknowns were observed for longer than 60 seconds. 30% were observed for longer than five minutes. And 10% of the unknowns were observed for longer than 30 minutes. And the average duration of observation for the unknowns was greater than for the knowns. We are not dealing, here at least, with short-term observations by incompetent observers seeing things under poor circumstances. Are there cases like that? Of course. That's about as useful as telling the basketball coach you got a bunch of midgets. He says, I don't care about the midgets. Give me the, the six, the seven footers. They play basketball in Australia? I suddenly realize. <laughs> That's a terrible thing to say. Uh, in other words, you look at the good cases, we got plenty of those, don't worry about the bad ones, throw them out, eliminate them. When you're mining gold, keep the gold, throw away the dross. Okay? All right. Largest official comprehensive scientific study ever done, one of the ones we've been lied to the most about. Uh, how many people here have read a copy of Blue Book Special Report number 14? Would you raise your hand, please? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Hey, when you pay good money, they come out in droves, the scientific ufologists. Huh? <laughs> right, Bill? Uh, it is interesting to note that there are 12 anti-UFO books of which I am aware. Not one even mentions Blue Book Special Report number 14 even though all the authors were aware of it. The four basic rules for debunkdom. One, what the public doesn't know, I'm not going to tell. Two, don't bother me with the facts, my mind's made up. Three, if you can't attack the data, attack the people, it's a heck of a lot easier. And finally, four, don't do your research by investigation, it's too much trouble. Do it by proclamation, nobody will know the difference anyway. These hold good in many other areas besides ufology, but they're particularly prominent here. All right, oldest, largest, look, let's look at some other ones. There's two up here. The UFO evidence on the left has information on 746 unknowns sifted out from about 4,500 cases investigated by the mostly professional members of the old NICAP, National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena. Entire chapters on sightings by commercial pilots, by military pilots, by law enforcement officers, a whole chapter on sightings by engineers, scientists, astronomers, and an excellent chapter on evidence for intelligent control of some UFOs. Privately published, most people don't even know that it exists. On the right, most people don't know that this document exists either. Doesn't show up very well on the white, does it? Symposium on Unidentified Flying Objects. Hearings before the Committee on Science and Astronautics, House of Representatives, Congressional Hearings, in other words, July 29, 1968, my birthday. Six scientists testified, if we have any astrologers out there, I'll give you the details later. Uh, six scientists testified in person, six more of us in writing only. I was one of the latter group of six, the only one of the 12 without a PhD. Uh, the testimony of all 12 was included in this 247-page volume. The speakers cover a broad range of professional backgrounds, nuclear physics, astrophysics, astronomy, psychology, sociology, biology, gravitational physics, civil engineering, from respectable institutions like Harvard, Berkeley, Stanford, Westinghouse, General Dynamics. The best paper by far, in my view, is one by the late Dr. James E. McDonald, a professor of physics at the University of Arizona. Jim was initially a skeptic. He was challenged. He visited NICAP, the people who did that, visited Project Blue Book, wound up to his surprise, he's a professor of physics at the University of Arizona now, wound up to his surprise spending almost full time for almost three years investigating UFO sightings. 
He personally interviewed over 500 witnesses. And these were almost all pre-screened cases, so he spent most of his time on the unknowns rather than the knowns. He visited here in Australia in the late 60s, as a matter of fact. To make a very long story short, he concluded this is the most challenging scientific problem of our time, that some, underlined again, UFOs are extraterrestrial in origin, and that the Air Force Project Blue Book effort was completely inadequate from a scientific viewpoint. He went on to present information on 41 separate cases, subdivided into six groups, each group dealing with the typical objections that you've probably all heard. How come they're never seen on radar? Gives you half a dozen good radar cases. Why aren't they ever seen over big cities? Gives you a bunch of big city cases. How come there's always only one witness? Gives you a bunch of multiple witness cases. 10, 20, 50 witnesses? Why aren't they ever seen by the professionals who watch the sky, the astronomers, the meteorologists, the pilots? Gives you a bunch of sightings by each of those groups. So you can raise any objections you wish. Please don't reach a conclusion until you study the evidence because none of those or any others I've been able to find in 38 years of looking stand up under careful scrutiny. Uh, how many people have read the UFO evidence, the report on the left? One? We should eliminate Mr. Chalker. He's read them all. Uh, he will leave the room. <laughs> yeah. How about the congressional hearings on the right? Two. Okay. Well, it's always good to know where your friends are. Uh, <laughs> let's look at the next one. Dr. J. Allen Hynek was the Air Force Project Blue Book scientific consultant on UFOs for 20 years, an astronomer uh, famous for his involvement with close encounters of the third kind, and for back in the 60s saying some UFO sightings in Michigan might have been caused by swamp gas. And boy, did the cartoonists have fun with that. Alan collected, I think, the last time I heard over 100 cartoons about swamp gas. Anyway, to make a long story short, he does not, did not believe that UFOs can be swept under the swamp gas rug or any other rug. He presented information on more than 70 sightings that couldn't be explained, including close encounters of the first, second, and third kind. That's where the title of the movie came from. Had some recommendations, where do we go from here, what can be done, what should be done some strong comments about the inadequacy not only of Project Blue Book, but of the University of Colorado study, the so-called Condon Report. One of the most mistitled books ever published. It isn't scientific, and it's about IFOs, not UFOs. It's 965 pages long, though. Uh, usually referred to as the Condon Report because it was done under the direction of a world-famous physicist, Dr. Edward U. Condon, at the University of Colorado. Uh, headlines all over the world when this study was done. Scientific study shows no UFOs, no benefit to science from study of your UFOs nonsense, scientists shows. And there were nasty editorials on occasion. Uh, now the UFO nuts can join the members of the Flat Earth Society and let the rest of us do something useful. Now all that nonsense, and that's what it was, was based on the press release from the Air Force and on Condon's summary and conclusions, the first two chapters of the book. And from my dealings with him, I honestly believe he didn't read the rest of the report. And once again, as was the case with Blue Book Special Report 14, what the public was told and what the document shows are exactly the opposite. The data in the report make an excellent case for some UFOs as extraterrestrial spacecraft. Now, I don't want to nitpick. It would take me an hour to do it the injustice it deserves. but. Let me give you the findings of a special UFO subcommittee established by the world's largest group of space scientists, the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. They set up an 11-man subcommittee, guys from universities, industry, military, or government, I should say, I suppose. Uh, they spent three years looking at the data, including this report. They very quietly published their findings. They concluded, believe it or not, that one could come to the opposite conclusions from Dr. Condon's based on the data in the report. That any phenomena with 30% unidentifiable was certainly worthy of further attention. Three different sessions have been held at international AIA meetings at which papers were presented by professionals dealing with flying saucers. 30% of 117 cases studied in detail could not be identified. Now, there's a whole big chapter on government involvement in UFO investigations. 
Strangely enough, they never mentioned the largest study ever done for the government, Blue Book Special Report 14. Did Condon know about it? Of course he did. I wrote him about it, got an answer back. Remember the rule, what the public doesn't know, we're not going to tell them. How many people have read uh, the Condon report? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. How about he uh, Heineck's book? Since he was here in Australia in the past, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. It's usually Heineck over Condon, two to one, but we'll get back. There's a reason for asking those questions. I'm not going to tell you what it is just yet. All right, now the obvious question, with all these mountains of evidence, how come the big shots of science and journalism haven't jumped on the pro-UFO bandwagon as they obviously have not? We'll get into that in a minute. First, I want to clear up another myth. Uh, this is one you'll hear often. I heard it tonight from Philip Adams, who organized the uh, Skeptic Society here, that most people didn't believe in UFOs. That's nonsense. These guys never provide any evidence to support that. They tell you from the top of their head by proclamation. We know our audience, most of those people don't believe in UFOs. Do you have any poll results? No. Here are four consecutive polls done by Gallup in the States, dating back to 66 and then onward. These are the believers, the non-believers, and the we don't know what's going on people over here. Uh, way back 30 years ago, the ratio of believers to non-believers was one and a half to one, 46% to 29%. Of course, the press was slightly misleading. They said only 46% believed, implying that 54% did not, which, of course, wasn't true. But press coverage is a whole PhD thesis dealing with that, how rotten it's been. Uh, by 1973, after we'd been to the moon, it was 54 to 30, 1.8 to 1. By 78, better than 2 to 1. Now, the noisy negativists have been so successful that it was only, only 1.6 to 1, believers over non-believers by 87, and similar results in 91. Now, the skeptics have an explanation. That's because of all those supermarket tabloids. Really? That's a testable hypothesis. If it were true that the reason for the beliefs in UFOs was the tabloids, then certainly one would expect that the greater the education, the less likely to believe in flying saucers. Because let's hope it's the truth that the greater the education, the less likely to be influenced by the tabloids. Well, the data's there. Sorry, skeptics. These are adults with a grade school, high school, or college education. These are not kids. Now, with only a grade school education, the ratio of believers to non-believers is 36 to 38. But by the time you get a high school diploma, the ratio of good guys to bad guys is better than 2 to 1. With a college background, the real surprise, 66 to 23. Almost three times as many people say they're real as say they're imaginary. Simple fact, the greater the education, the more likely to believe in flying saucers. If you're a believer, you're with the cream of the crop, not at the bottom of the barrel. And it's time to stop being closet ufologists and apologist ufologists. Tell it like it is. It's okay. I've given 700 lectures. Never an egg or tomato. That is not a challenge, please. <laughs> okay, let's turn this off and let's go back to my rhetorical question. How come the big shots haven't jumped on the pro-UFO bandwagon? Four reasons. One could spend an hour on each, which, of course, I cannot do tonight. First is ignorance of the relevant data. Uh, I've talked to as many as 2,000 people at once, 1,000 engineers and scientists at once. Uh, I never find more than a few percent have read any of these documents that I've mentioned. The noisiest negativism comes from those who know the least about the subject. I happen to believe if one is expressing a purportedly professional opinion that one has a very serious obligation to either know what one is talking about, which certainly means to have studied the relevant data, or to shut up. Now, everybody's entitled to personal opinions. But professional opinions, we certainly expect are to be based on knowledge and ethics, something sadly lacking in the noisy negativist pronouncements from on high. Typically, you scratch a skeptic, you find somebody who's putting down what he isn't up on. So the first problem, ignorance. Not stupidity, ignorance. Second problem, 
the laughter curtain, the fear of ridicule that keeps people from reporting their sightings. The polls show, in my own experience across the continents, that about 10% of the people believe they've seen a flying saucer. How many of you reported what you saw? I'm lucky if it's 10% of the 10%. Biggest reason for not reporting? They'd think I was some kind of a nut. Or is it nutter that you use down here, I guess? But uh, I think the subject's too important to be left in the hands of the cartoonists and comedians and Steve Spielbergs and Carl Sagan's of the world. And progress is being made. Professionals are getting involved. There was a fine symposium on UFO abductions held at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, co-chaired by a professor of physics at MIT and Dr. Mack here. And the proceedings have been published. Now, you can't get in much higher circles than that. You've got to have a PhD piled higher and deeper in them. That's the real life. Uh, we're making progress. There have been a dozen PhD theses done. They're all listed in my book. They're listed on the CD-ROM. There's room for 50, but at least there's a dozen rather than zero. Third problem, ego. If aliens are visiting Earth, some groups say, they certainly want to talk to us, particularly astronomers and journalists. Talk to one... <laughs> hey, that's the way it is. I can't help it. <laughs> in a small town in the States, college town, called the paper, you're gonna cover my lecture? Boy, did I get read the riot act. We wouldn't waste two seconds on that nonsense. And he went on, finished me off. If aliens were visiting planet Earth, they'd have called a press conference and I would have been invited, said this editor. <laughs> a Harvard astronomer once said, if aliens were visiting Earth, they would certainly wish to talk to the National Academy of Sciences of which both he and his good buddy, Dr. Condon, were members at the time, and the whole attitude is, haven't asked for an appointment, must not be coming here. <laughs> Actually, Flying Saucers finished the job that old Nicolaus Copernicus, the Polish astronomer, started of taking man out of the center of the universe. You all remember Nick, well, he died in 1543, but that's okay. That was the year his book was published, in which he made the ridiculous suggestion. Would you believe he thought that the Earth wasn't in the middle of the universe? The sun was. Now, he didn't let the book be published till the year he died, because he knew what the reaction would be. Somebody else got burned at the stake for agreeing with him. <laughs> and the book was banned for 300 years by guys in white coats, prayer robes back then. Now we got them in lab coats. And they have just as much trouble. Okay, we've got ignorance, laughter curtain, ego. The fourth problem, it's impossible. I'll put my own professional hat back on. I've worked on more canceled government-sponsored R&D programs than anybody, a dubious distinction indeed. <laughs> Not the way I set out in life. <laughs> Usually you can summarize these objections. It's impossible. Now, there used to be a whole long list. I mean, it's backward science, of course. These guys say what people claim to have observed is impossible, so they couldn't have observed it. The real scientist says, hmm, those observations are interesting. I wonder how to explain them. Now, the list has shrunk, but there's still one of these arguments still being made. You can't get here from there, usually by astronomers. And the argument is sort of long-winded. They say, look, it's a huge universe, billions of galaxies, billions of stars, life all over the place out there, some of it more advanced than we are, but you can't get here from there. Give us a few bucks, we'll build a radio telescope, listen for signals, because undoubtedly the more advanced civilizations are trying to attract our attention. You know, hello Earth, hello Earth, just waiting for us to join the Galactic Radio Network. <laughs> and when we do, they will then transmit to us all the secrets of the universe. Did you ever hear such silly drivel in your life? Why would an advanced civilization give its secrets to a primitive society whose major activity is tribal warfare? <laughs> That's us, I hope you recognize that description. <laughs> Well, I still haven't answered the question, of course, can you get here from there or not? Uh, not on a bicycle is my simple answer. <laughs> if you look at the scientific literature, it's littered with false pronouncements by astronomers about the impossibility of flight in airplanes, flight in orbit. Just to give you one example, uh, Dr. Campbell, a Canadian astronomer, and I live in Canada, and I'm a dual citizen, so you can take pot shots at me both as an American and as a Canadian. <laughs> Dr. Campbell did a paper in which he tried to calculate the required initial launch weight of a rocket able to get a man to the moon and back. A reasonable question, how big? 
pages of equations, bottom line, would have to weigh at launch, just a dumb old chemical rocket, a million million tons. Now even for me that's too big. Funny thing, less than 30 years later, still with a dumb old chemical rocket, we sent three guys to the moon and back, initial launch weight, only 3,000 tons. It was only off a factor of 300 million. When astronomers do calculation about space travel, something about which they know absolutely nothing in their training, their background, their professional knowledge, they're almost invariably astronomically in error. Uh, some of his great assumptions, incidentally, a single stage rocket would be used. Silly assumption. That uh, you'd limit it to 1G acceleration. Stupid assumption. That uh, you have to provide all the energy yourself. We use cosmic freeloading every time we turn around in space. Uh, that you would limit the velocity, uh, the exhaust velocity, some ridiculous value, about one-sixth of what we know you could get even then. And of course, the worst assumption when you're coming back to Earth, you've got to slow down. That's a good idea. When you come in 25,000 miles an hour, it's a little hard to land at that speed. But he said the only way you can slow down is to use a retro rocket. But of course, every pound of propellant that you use in a retro rocket had to be launched from the Earth, slow down at the moon, launch from the moon, and slow down back here. It's at least a 10 to 1 ratio each step. What do we do? We say, thank you, God, for giving us an atmosphere. We'll use it. And the important thing, then, is to come at the correct angle. Too steep, hole in the ground. Too shallow, bye by Earth. So smart instead of strong. And all our space travel involves being smart instead of strong. Well, I still haven't answered the question. Can you get here from there or not? Well, you can. Many published studies by engineers showing the trips to nearby stars, local neighborhood now, are feasible with round trip time, shorter than the average person's lifespan, using staged, you know, big rocket, smaller, smaller, fission or fusion nuclear rockets, on both of which I have worked. And some people think, uh-oh, here comes the science fiction. No. As a matter of fact, let's put the projector on. You might as well look at a nuclear rocket just so you know they really existed. Yeah, there's the Phoebus 1B from Los Alamos. There are a whole bunch of these tested. This is back almost 30 years ago. Uh, the reactors inside there, less than six feet in diameter, power level of the biggest one, just this big, 4,400 megawatts, twice the power of a big dam that's producing power. 4,400 megawatts, only this big. That's nuclear fission. Uh, in case you're wondering, well, how do we know that isn't Walt Disney? There's one in operation out of Jackass Flats, Nevada. Make of that what you will. Uh, liquid hydrogen comes in, goes down, goes out, hot. Comes in cold, goes out hot. Very simple. No oxygen required, though. Now, this is nuclear fission. I'm really much more excited about nuclear fusion. That's the most important source of energy in all our lives. The sun up there is a fusion factory. That's the process that produces the energy. More than 30 years ago, I worked on nuclear fusion rockets. We didn't test hardware. We spent only a few million bucks. But if you use the right stuff in the right way, it can kick particles out the back end of a nuclear fusion rocket, which only have 10 million times as much energy per particle as they can get in a dumb old chemical rocket. On a miles per gallon basis, fusion is definitely the way to go. And do I think aliens use fission or fusion again here? Of course not, because I left something out. Friedman's Law. Technological progress comes from doing things differently in an unpredictable way. The future, technologically, is not an extrapolation of the past. You've got to change how you do things. That nuclear rocket is not just a better chemical rocket. Entirely different physics. This laser pointer, which sometimes works, uh, is not just a better light bulb. The micro-integrated circuits that make today's computers, the things that allow you to put an enormous amount of information on a silly little disk, are not just tiny vacuum tubes. Entirely different physics. The point of this, of course, if somebody out there somewhere got started on his or her technological kick a little bit before we did, they're going to know some things that we don't know. How much time is available for the head start? Well, there's stars in the neighborhood a billion years older than the sun. Well, let's be conservative. 
Maybe they only got started a million years before we did. Let's be super conservative. Maybe they only got started 10,000 years before we did. Anybody in his right mind know what our technology will be 10,000 years from now? No less even 1,000? I don't think so. We know enough to get to the stars. It's a political choice if you want to spend the money. But we have to expect that, as Arthur Clarke once said, advanced technology is by definition magic. That's M-A-G-I-C. My book is M-A-J-I-C. Two different aspects, if you will. Okay. These are the, I'll call them the intellectual side of the problem. You know, facts, data, technology. But the real question is... <laughs> Never mind the saucer. Did you see the guys who were driving? Does a nuclear physicist believe in little green men? Well, they're usually little. They're practically never green, whether they're men or women or both or neither, I don't know. The evidence is overwhelming that responsible, respectable earthlings, people whose testimony you'd like on your side in a court of law, have indeed on many an occasion observed not only saucers on or near the ground, but saucers accompanied by critters, humanoids, creatures, little guys, whatever you want to call them. I don't mean once or twice. The Humanoid Study Group of the Mutual UFO Network, one of the world's largest groups, 5,000 plus members, I'm on the board, has collected more than 3,500 humanoid sightings. A man named Ted Phillips in Missouri has collected more than 5,000 physical trace cases from 65 countries. These are cases where the saucer is seen on or near the ground, and after it leaves, one finds physical changes, the equivalent of burn circles, burn rings, landing gear marks, uh, 23%, more than a thousand of these cases involve reports of beings associated with the crap. And the world's outstanding abduction researchers, Dr. Mack and several others, can certainly list over a thousand cases for you of abductions involving observations of typically little guys. We'll work our way up. A little hard to get adjusted. We'll start with just a normal run-of-the-mill physical trace case. This one from Delphos, Kansas. The trace is that ring there. Ronnie Johnson, age 16, finishing his chores for the evening, was 75 feet away to the left, getting ready to go in for dinner, looks up, there's a big mushroom-shaped object sitting a foot or two off the ground, about 10 feet in diameter, brilliantly glowing, so bright that he's temporarily blinded. And he's paralyzed, he literally can't move. So is his dog, so it's not psychological. He's standing there gawking at this thing when suddenly it takes off slowly, just clearing the shed that you see the shadow of here, dashes the 250 feet into the house, shouts at his parents to come and see the flying saucer that he had just seen. They laugh at him. He gets mad. You don't need to believe me. You go out and see it for yourself. They do go out and they do see it. Then he tries to convince them, and eventually successfully, to come back and look where it had landed on their farm near Delphos, Kansas. They're, to say the least, dubious. They come back here though, and this ring of soil oh well must be Murphy's Law here huh? is there another laser pointer in the house? <laughs> uh, anyway, you can see the dry ring of soil in the middle of this thing <laughs> and uh, his mother reaches down, the soil ring was glowing, which is a little weird, and the bottom of the tree was glowing. His mother reaches down, touches the glowing ring of soil, lifts her hand up, her fingers go numb. She can't take pulses at the rest home where she works part-time as a nurse. They get a little frightened by that, and uh, they call the sheriff's office. They come out and check for radioactivity for some reason. That's what everybody worries about. Uh, believe me, there are a lot worse things in the world than radioactivity. I'll duck when the tomatoes come for that one. But uh, he doesn't find any radioactivity, the sheriff. An article appears in a local paper, and about a month later, somebody sends ten Phil Ted Phillips in the neighboring state of Missouri, this is Kansas, a copy of the article. Ted calls the sheriff, checks out the Johnsons, find people, known them for years. He goes out there, didn't expect to find much. It had rained, snowed. Snow had melted. Gets out there, everything is mud except for the dry ring of soil. Mud inside, mud outside, but the ring is dry. Pours water on it, runs right off. 
14 inches down in the ring, the soil is dry compared to the soil nearby. He runs tests on the soil. You can see the results of those. This is a seed germination test. On the left, the ring soil won't grow anything. On the right, normal soil from a few feet away grows stuff fine. He ran moisture absorption tests. That's water sitting on the ring soil. Water, not plastic, not glue, water. It won't absorb moisture. Ted sent me samples of the soil. I had good lab tests run. Ring soil on the left, normal soil on the right, obviously different in color and texture. The good lab tests show the ring soil at a higher level of soluble minerals than the normal soil. It was too salty to grow anything if you want to look at it in those terms. Does this mean the aliens dumped their garbage there? Of course not probably means that normal soil like that on the right was intensely irradiated with something like microwaves, like cooking a turkey in a microwave oven, drive off the moisture, convert insolubles to solubles. New direction for ufological research. Lab testing, something you can get your mitts on. This is one, as I said, of 5,000 physical trace cases. And like 77% of those cases, it did not involve reports of creatures, critters, etc. But the next case does. The most famous abduction case, Barney and Betty Hill, and the creature isn't the dog. <laughs> they were, it's a very famous case, but I'll go over it anyway. Some of you weren't alive when the book came out. Uh, Betty and Barney were driving south from Montreal, Canada, to their home in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, right on the Atlantic coast between Portland, Maine, and Boston. 1961, beautiful clear night, late at night, nobody around. Betty suddenly spots a strange something out there. Barney is driving. Remember, this is in the United States. We drive on the wrong side of the road. You know that. Uh, Betty's looking out this way. She's afraid to say anything to Barney, but she grabs the binoculars. They're bird watchers. Watches this thing for some time and finally gets up enough nerve to say, Barney, there's a flying saucer out there. Oh, Betty, come on. There are no flying saucers. It must be an airplane, probably a Piper Cub. Don't worry about it. Barney, it can't be. Look how it's moving. Look at the lights. Hmm. Must be a helicopter, Betty. They can move around, strangely. In the middle of the night, out in the middle of nowhere. What the heck's a helicopter doing there? So they talk about it for some time. They're in the valley, driving straight south. This thing is following the contour of the hills. And all of a sudden, it sweeps out across the road, stops dead over there. They're going this way. Barney jams on the brakes, grabs the binoculars. He's bound to determine he's going to prove to Betty that there's nothing strange about that strange thing out there. Less than 200 yards away, 60 to 80 feet in diameter, not a sound. No visible external engines, no wings, no tail. He cranks up the binoculars, but he's shouting at him, come back Barney, where are you going? This thing's less than 200 yards away. He's heading across a field, cranks up the binoculars, uh oh. Double row of windows and behind the windows, some strange looking character staring back at him. He suddenly gets very frightened, dashes back to the car. <laughs> Gee whiz. Uh, what does that mean? Ten minutes? Okay. Boy, i got to talk fast. Anyway, dashes back to the car. They take off. There's some uh, beeping sounds, another set of beeping sounds. They see a sign that says Concord, New Hampshire, 17 miles. They thought it was 50 miles. They go on home. There's a lot of other little details. You have to read the book to interrupt the journey. Uh, they report the sighting, they get a book out of the library which mentions NICAP and an address, they write NICAP, an investigator comes out, he has them go over the whole story, it's obvious they got home two hours later than they should have gotten home. Suggested that they be hypnotized, uh, they're both busy people, Betty is social worker, supervisor in the welfare department, state of New Hampshire, Barney works for the post office, on the Governor's Civil Rights Commission as well. Two years go by, Betty's colleagues had said, oh don't worry about it, your memory will come back, it didn't. Barney's ulcer started to act up, he couldn't work. Uh, finally, it gets suggested that they go to see a psychiatrist, maybe we can take care of the ulcer and find out what happened during this missing time experience. They do that every Saturday morning for three and a half months, each independently gets hypnotized by Dr. Benjamin Simon, who has them relive a portion of the experience, independently induces amnesia at the end of the sessions, session sends them, neither one knows what's going on in these sessions, of course. So that they can't talk to each other. This goes on for a few months. 
it's obvious that something good has happened because Barney's ulcer goes away and he's able to get back to work. Dr. Simon figures they're ready, plays a composite tape, which I have heard. They're astonished to find that each independently had relived the same incredible experience that craft having landed, then being taken on board by the beings Barney saw, treated as specimens, put back out, told they wouldn't remember what happened, and didn't until this elaborate, sophisticated procedure. Nice story. I had the opportunity to spend four hours with Betty and Barney, just the three of us. I was very impressed. I buy the story. You say, hey, where's the evidence? Well, one place to look. Betty, under hypnosis, describes how she's trying to get the leader of this crew to tell her where he's from. And he shows her a star map, which she doesn't recognize anything. You know, where are you on a map? He says, you know where you are? No. How can I tell you where I'm from if you don't know where you're at? <laughs> End of discussion. Dr. Simon has her draw it. You can see it in the next slide. Fascinating. Base stars. Well, if I can get this, yeah. Now, normally you kick things to make them work, but how do you <laughs> kick the laser pointer? Anyway, in the lower right, there are two big circles. Uh, those are the base stars, heavy trade routes, occasional expeditions, light expeditions. The only trouble is, what does it mean? A brilliant woman named Marjorie Fish built 26 three-dimensional models of our local galactic neighborhood, eventually found one pattern, this is a typical one of her models, that matched angle for angle, line length for line length, what Betty had drawn under a post-hypnotic suggestion to be drawn only if she could remember the map accurately. Uh, this work is quite exciting. This is the pattern that matches angle for angle, line length for line length, upper right-hand corner. That's uh, the sun. All the stars are in a plane, which is rather unusual, like thin slices of pepperoni on a pepperoni pizza. Uh, this work also tells us where those guys originate. The sun is up there. You see the word sun. And uh, the base stars, and you can see them and we can't. Zeta-1 and Zeta-2 reticuli, constellation of reticulum, the net from down here, 37 light years away, 100 times closer to each other than the sun is to the next star over. And they just, and this is going to be announced next week, just found a planet around one of those two stars. Remarkable piece of work. There's a 32-page full-color booklet that describes it. I have the world supply. Contact me. We'll tell you how to get it. It's listed in the book and on the CD-ROM. Uh, what do those guys look like? This will tell you. Your typical Zeta reticulin. What else can I say? <laughs> now, let's talk about crash saucers very briefly. These are headlines from evening papers, July 8, 1947. Army finds air saucer on ranch in New Mexico. This goes to high officers, Dateline, Roswell. Chicago Daily News, not a tiny paper. One Time Zone West, Roswell Daily Record. Roswell Army Airfield, this is, captures flying saucer and ranch in Roswell region. One Time Zone West, this is my favorite, the Los Angeles Herald Express. Notice that headline. Do you ever see a headline that big about flying saucers? July 8th, evening paper, 1947. Notice the second line. Cover story is already in. General believes it is radar weather gadget. The story made headlines around the world for about five hours. It's a long, complicated story, which I don't have time to tell you. There's Major Jesse Marcel, the base intelligence officer for the only atomic bombing group in the world. He went out to the crash site. He brought stuff back, flew with it to the headquarters of the 8th Air Force. And the general there says, you don't say anything, I'll take care of it. Just a radar reflector from a weather balloon. I was the first to talk to Jesse way back in 1978. He died in 1986, only the intelligence officer for the only atomic bombing group in the world. There's General Ramey on the left, Thomas du DuBose on the right. Talked to him. He took the call from Washington telling him to cover it up. First hand, he was a retired general, 88 years old when I last talked to him. He's dead now, too. There he is uh, at age 88. Super guy, 16,000, 18,000 hours as a pilot. There's a map of New Mexico. Roswell is down the lower right-hand corner. There were actually two crashes. Roswell over here, the crash over here, and over here. Lots of military activity. This is what the westernmost crash looked like. Saucer in the back, very cold, according to one eyewitness. 
Uh, four bodies outside, two dead, one dying, one alive, and no, I don't know where the live one went. This is what he looked like, though. Four long fingers, big head, big eyes, skinny little body, not much nose, mouth, ears. Not at all like the alien autopsy footage, which I think is fraudulent. This is my book with Don Berliner, Crash at Corona. That's the nearest small town, not Roswell. The Roswell was where the military was. Here's the Air Force report. It was just a mogul balloon. 1,000 pages of baloney, a 23-page report with lies about me and several other people, including Major Marcel. The New York Times bought it hook, line, and sinker. You can buy this report for 52 U.S. dollars plus shipping and handling. Makes a good paperweight. Uh, of course, there's a Majestic 12 story. We got a roll of film saying it was a briefing document for General Eisenhower, uh, saying that a saucer crashed outside Roswell. Bodies were found. President Truman set up a super special group, Operation Majestic 12. That's why I wrote a book, 12 years of research about that group. I think the documents are genuine. Here's the list. The all-star cast included the first three directors of Central Intelligence, first Secretary of Defense, six outstanding sci five outstanding scientists, one of whom was a total debunker, Dr. Donald Menzel, three anti-UFO books, a Harvard astronomer. I determined that he led a double life, had a longer continuous association with the National Security Agency, he said to Jack Kennedy, of anybody in the country. Once I found out that he worked for this group, I did a lot more research. There are other documents. This is the order to establish Majestic 12. People object to the... Uh, Truman's signature, it's too much like Truman's signature, which is one of those crazy arguments. <laughs> well, it's identical to this other signature. It isn't. We've just had some very sophisticated uh, computer work done. It, it is interesting, however. It just says, go ahead, with reference to Dr. Bush. He was one of the people, no connection with George, incidentally. I uh, want to show you something. Look carefully at the date up there, and you'll see it's 24, 1947 period, and it's offset, not typed at the same time as this. No forger would do that, of course, and wouldn't use two typewriters and all the rest. But here's what's interesting. The first two documents there are dates from items from Dr. Bush's office. It always put a period after the date. Now, according to my colleague who's had 30 years of photo analysis, the bottom one, which is from the Truman Forrestal menu, um, memo, is done on the same typewriter. So, therefore, this memo was typed in 1947. Some people say, oh, that looks like 1963 type to me. Show us an analysis, guys. It isn't as simple as proclamation. Oh, we had another memo that was found, this time in the National Archives, a memo from uh, Robert Cutler, Ike's Special Assistant for Security, General Twining, uh, who was a member of the MJ-12 group. And the Im important thing about this, this is the only document we have in hardcover, subject, National Security Council, NSC, MJ-12 Special Studies Project. What the briefing talks about is the recovery and so forth. This seems to indicate that it's real. And what's really nice about this document, done in the large pica type, is that I got $1,000 from one of the noisiest negativists, Philip Klass, who challenged me. Hey, the tradition at the White House at that time was a small elite type. This is done in the large pica type. He had nine samples to prove it should have been elite. Challenged me to find any genuine memos done by the right people, right time frame, and offered me $100 each, unfortunately limiting it to a maximum of 10, for any genuine such memos that I found. I went to my files and got 20. I went to the archives and got 15 more, sent him a bill, and he sent me a check for $1,000. Can you imagine generalizing from nine to 250,000 pages of National Security Council material at the Eisenhower Library? Of course, he'd never been there. Don't bother me with the facts. My mind's made up. OK, there's Mr. Class. He's not worth spending a lot of time on. <laughs> There's my big early report. There's the alien autopsy memo. I think it's a fraud. There's a whole chapter in the book about it. Uh, this is one of the new documents we got. It's only a special operations manual. 
extraterrestrial entities and technology, recovery and disposal, 20 pages. Tells you what to do if you're on the team that recovers bodies and wreckage. Kind of exciting when you read it, frankly. There's my book, Top Secret Magic. That's the markings on the menu, uh, on the memo. We'll run through these pictures quickly. You've probably seen them all. They're old, but this is McMinnville, Oregon. Oh, same one. What do you know? Enlargement. Big one again. Similar object taken four years and 6,000 miles away in France. French military pilot. Santa Ana, California. Got 100 pages of analysis of these. There's three of them. Similar object, upper right-hand corner, filmed in Cluj, Romania. There were three pictures there, too. Detailed analysis. Sequence of seven over Salt Lake City, Utah. There's four, three is seven, enlarge five. I think there's some ionized air plasma related to a magneto-aerodynamic propulsion system. That's a whole other lecture, similar to the electromagnetic submarine built in the 60s. Hawaii up top in the middle there, there's an enlargement, another plasma there. Vancouver, British Columbia in Canada, notice the enlargement, rather spectacular picture, careful analysis, legitimate. Island of uh, Trindagi, 600 miles east of the coast of Brazil, bunch of people on the deck of an official Brazilian Navy ship, there's a photographer, he takes a bunch of pictures. One down here, that was an enlargement. Here's number two. Here's number three. Here's number four. We're right back where we started. At least several companies could build things that look like that, but I don't know of any that could build things that look like that and fly like that. High speed, sharp turn, high acceleration, released to the public by the president of Brazil. If it wasn't built here, it was built someplace else time we did something about it. What I'm trying to do is make you aware of the enormous amount of data indicating that some UFOs are extraterrestrial spacecraft and to make you aware that we're dealing with the cosmic water gate and I'll prove that to you in a minute and a half. You say freedom of information Stan, how could they cover it up? This is what I get under freedom of information. <laughs> a group of us went after the CIA, we want all your UFO stuff, we don't have any UFO stuff, you do too, we do not, we go to court, they get ordered to do a search, the CIA says, oh, look, we found 900 pages of UFO material. And they gave us a list of 57 other UFO documents from other agencies that they couldn't release, 18 from the super secret NSA, National Security Agency. We asked for them under freedom of information. We got told in no uncertain terms, national security. Forget it. We appealed. They denied. We go to court. Judge says do a search. We know about 18 NSA UFO documents. They come back to court. They found 239. But 79 were from other agencies, 23 from the CIA, which somehow missed them. Their own 160, they threw out 456. We said, fine, we'll take them. You can't have any national security. Go away. We try a legal ploy. We ask that they show the documents to the judge so he can determine whether they properly invoke national security. They refused to show him any of the documents, but they did prepare for him a 21-page above-top-secret affidavit justifying the withholding. He got to see it in chambers, got a special clearance. Our lawyer didn't get to see it. He was so impressed that he ruled for the NSA. Thou shalt not release those documents. Public interest in disclosure, far outweighed by potential danger to the security of the United States. National security and flying saucers. We go to the Federal Court of Appeals. In five days, instead of the usual two months, they agree with the lower court seeing the affidavit. Supreme Court wouldn't hear the case. We filed a Freedom of Information Act request and eventually we got the affidavit. Here it is, it's a legal document. We expected some censorship. You know, there's a little. <laughs> well, not too bad. It sort of builds up a little and gets to you after a while. <laughs> Real exciting, and don't, don't tell me scrape off the black, there's nothing underneath. They Xerox it, you know, cut it out, and then Xerox it again. Uh, now, footnote to the story, and we're almost finished. The, uh, I naturally filed a Freedom of Information Act request to the CIA for the 23 UFO documents the NSA had found and the CIA hadn't. Supposed to respond in 10 working days. 35 months later, they responded. Uh, they agreed to release nine. They did release nine of the 23 documents. 
press abstracts of Eastern European newspaper articles about flying saucers, which the Russians had when they were published and in the original language. Their own 14 documents they withheld. I appealed two years later. They agreed to release tiny portions of them. This is a released CIA UFO document. There are eight words that you can read. Doc reference title, info location, info date, USSR, and a couple of strings and numbers. Mr. Class still maintains there can be no secrets from the wonderful Washington press corps. For 11 years I've been challenging him, even offered money, give me copies of those NSA documents. No takers yet. There's no question that there is a cosmic Watergate. What does all this mean? I think that we need to recognize what's going on. My goal, of course, is that my grandson's generation will behave in such a way that we can qualify for admission to the cosmic kindergarten and arrange a planet that is indeed suitable for intelligent life. I think we've done a lousy job so far. Thank you very much for listening. Is it, Bill, is it break time or are you going to say what it is? What? Or questions or what? Oh, okay. John, were you expecting a break? <laughs> no, you're, you want to go on. Okay, he's ready. Uh, if everybody would like to stand up and do a bit of calisthenic stretching for a couple of minutes. Uh